But anyway, we'll look at Acts chapter 8 today. Acts, we remember, is a book of transition. And we know that it connects, you know, the Gospels and the Epistles, connects the church and the synagogue, law and grace. Remember, the Scripture was not yet completed. And so the Acts of the Apostles and the miracles and the things that were going on were all a transition time. Uh, they were still going to the synagogue and uh, getting kicked out of the synagogue and, and now going to the church. And Philip's kind of a, 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 a preacher of an evangelist of transition because we know that Peter primarily started out ministering to Jews. It took quite a dream to get him to change. And Paul was called specifically to the Gentiles. And Philip starts out uh, as a Greek-speaking, uh, Greek culture Jew, speaks Greek fluently, ministering uh, to the Greeks, and then goes to Samaria, Samaria, half Jews, half Assyrians. And in this text today, he reaches an African man. And so what a great transition this is. Someone said hand-picked fruit is always the best. He will reach one Ethiopian eunuch today. Uh, bigness isn't always a blessing. Uh, sometimes it is, but I love this quote. God loves one by one ministry, W-O-N by O-N-E ministry. He loves us to evangelize in a personal way, and Philip does that today. So we'll look at Acts chapter 8, verse 26. We'll read about seven verses, if you'll stand with me, and look at this great text. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. God bless us. Thank you for this great story. So much here. And we'll study more today. God, I just pray that as we do this, you'll reign in our hearts and lives. Help me to say what you want me to say exactly. And I just pray you use me, hide me behind the cross, that we can all see this scenario here of Philip, the Jew ministering to this Ethiopian man in the middle of the desert in Gaza. What a great story and how you arranged it in your divine way. Bless now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. The angel of the Lord, literally the definite article is not there. This, an, this is an angel, but not the angel. In the Old Testament, remember, we learned that the word the, the definite article, in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord is always talking about whom? Jesus. In the New Testament, Jesus has already been to the earth. He's not going to come again until every eye will see him. Paul had a brightness that blinded him, but he didn't see the Lord, but he heard the voice of the Lord. But never again do we see the Lord. And so this is an angel. Some say Gabriel, we don't know, but an angel was here. And the angel said to him, go to Gaza. And I love that. Today we have the word saying, go. And we find here in Acts 8 what was commissioned in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. He goes there. And the uttermost parts of the world. He goes to Gaza. And Philip's obeying the commission of the Lord. And Philip's going to this deserted area. And here's a divinely arranged meeting. God said, go there, and God had someone there for him to meet. And ironically, again, in God's divine arrangement, what is he reading? Isaiah 53. Do you know that Isaiah 53 is not allowed to be read in the synagogue today? Had a preacher friend, he studied Hebrew quite a bit. He met with a rabbi, and the rabbi stopped meeting with him when he asked about Isaiah 53. It's not allowed today. 
people prior to Jesus believed Isaiah 53 was talking about the coming Messiah. But when Jesus came, they stopped believing that, stopped teaching that. Because Jesus, after all, fit the bill, didn't he? He fulfilled 300 plus scriptures of the Old Testament. And so here, verse 27, the king of Ethiopia, who was deified, by the way, as a god that was part of their religion, Candace was actually a title. She, she was the king's mother, and she had given this eunuch a lot of authority. And uh, wow, what a story, because remember in Jeremiah chapter 38, we have a reversal of sorts. Jeremiah's down in a pit, and he's physically saved. By what? By an Ethiopian. And so he's pulled out of a pit by a man from Ethiopia. We believe this is probably Sudan today. Probably the, the boundaries have changed some. But here he is now. Uh, he's traveling and he's on a mission. And probably they were people who believed in Judaism, had been converts to Judaism. We know there's a, conting a contingent of Jewish people in Africa today who claim that they are Jews by faith and physically Jews, descendants of uh, uh, Leah or Rachel's, uh, you know, servant. We, we don't know all the details and genealogy and all that stuff, but there are some there that profess to have been Jews for centuries, and it's probably true, and what I, according to what I've read, but there's probably a lot more to read out there. But here you have this great story, and we think of uh, the story of the Old Testament. I love the little chorus, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight, but not allowed in our church. What? Doesn't go like, no, it doesn't go like that. But I have preached years ago in areas where they said, please don't, you know, encourage people to come to our church who are not like us. Well, I have news for you. If someone's born again, they're like you and they're your brother and sister in Christ. And uh, we want to keep in, in mind that wonderful song that they're all precious in his sight. They're all precious in his sight because they're people for whom Christ died. And uh, we need to understand that, that here is a great example of reaching across racial lines to reach someone with the gospel. And this is such a wonderful story. Now, being a eunuch, this man, according to Matthew 19, there's several ways to become a eunuch. We're not going to go into that. You can read that later. But in Deuteronomy, that this man would be forbidden to enter the temple. Now, later in Isaiah's day, I, I have the reference here. It's Isaiah 56. Uh, that changed, and they would allow people in the temple under certain conditions. But we know that foreigners weren't allowed. And he had converted, obviously, to Judaism. And, and uh, he was on his way. Uh, she, he was on his way to worship, which would include so many things. The, the, the idea of singing and praying. And when we get, come here on Saturday morning, we get together, we worship the Lord. When you open your mouth and sing, you're worshiping God. We're not singing uh, for any other reason other than to worship Him. And so we worship and we pray and we read Scripture out loud. And, and uh, the word worship means to prostrate oneself, to bow down, often including kissing the feet of the one you are worshiping. One writer said this. He gives a word picture of a dog licking his master's feet. Isn't that interesting? licking your master's feet. And uh, I, I love what Scripture says. Uh, you know, Mephibosheth said, I, I'm a dead dog. Do you know we're all dead dogs without Christ? We're all dead dogs without Christ. You are what you are by the grace of God, not because there's any good in you, but because of His work in you. And if you're saved, He continues to work in your heart. And so here he is, he's, he's on his chariot, and the Bible said he is reading out loud Isaiah 53, ironically, the very text, the perfect text. Ironically, Philip meets him by, by God's divine direction, and they meet, and, and he's reading out loud. And by the way, that's a common thing to do throughout Scripture, read out loud. First time we find it, Exodus 24. Ezra read out loud. Josiah read out loud. Uh, Paul told Timothy, don't forget to read out loud. Public reading. It's important for us to read Scripture. I remember when I was uh, in, in my first year, I, I finished two-year degree in criminal justice, and I, I um, came to Bible college here at Temple, and, 
And I remember all the stuff I had to memorize, all the verses and scriptures. And I just struggled so much my first few years. I was ADD. I didn't really uh, care until the Lord started working on my heart. I started to love scripture. Uh, but I remember someone said, Dan, the best thing to do is read those verses out loud. Read that passage out loud over and over. It goes back through the ear gate. It helps you to memorize it. And it helped me. But reading out loud, others can hear it. And here, here he's reading this out loud and Philip hears him. Uh, Philip hears him. Uh, uh, you know, the Bible says he heard him in uh, verse 30. That's the word okua. I remember all those words, akuo, blepo, lambano. I had to memorize them in my vocab. And we got our word acoustics from this word akuo. So he hears it, a good old ear gate. He hears him reading. And he, he, what does he do? He runs to confront the guy. Oh, I love that. I, I read one evangelist who said, the evangelistic harvest is always urgent. We're not always urgent, but the, the, the harvest is white, overripe and ready. And so he hears him, and uh, God's arranged this meeting, and he's fulfilling Acts 1.8, and he runs. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel. And he preached Jesus unto him. That's a great word, our great word, evangelize. In Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 8, I'm going to turn there. You can wait where you are, but I think 11, did Kenneth put 1118 up there? I don't know if our, yeah, there it is. Uh, oh, I think you already had it up there. Chapter 11, verse 18, how God had granted repentance to the Gentiles. Did you know even repentance is a gift from God? Even repentance, for God to allow you to repent, it still takes his grace to bring you to that place. But in Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 8, I'm going to read you a verse here. We don't have that on the screen, but I want to read it to you. It says here in 8.8 8, that Nehemiah explained things to the people. So they read in the book in the law of God distinctively, or distinctly, and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. So Nehemiah caused them to understand the reading. Now here we have the same situation. Here's an Ethiopian man, he's reading, and he's reading from the Septuagint. A direct quote is found right in our Greek text. Septuagint, you say, what is that, Pastor? That is the Greek text of their day. Those that could carry Scripture in the Greek would carry the Septuagint. And today we have the whole thing. But I presume this man maybe just had a scroll or a portion of a scroll of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah's scroll was 26 feet long. They didn't have codex. They didn't have pages to turn. You'd have to unroll that scroll and find the place. So the amount of work involved of all the scrolls out there and to have a 26-foot long scroll and for the, the idea that he's reading Isaiah 53, you think about that. There's no coincidence here. God divinely arranged this. So he's reading the text and, and uh, Philip's going to come and explain it to him. And it's, it's amazing to me. Uh, so people say, well, I, I really don't witness. I don't know how to witness. If God can use Balaam's ass to speak, he can use you. Yeah, he can use you because he's God. And so look at verse 31. I love this. Philip runs in verse 30. Ask him if he understands what he reads in the last part of verse 30. And he said, how can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. Oh, I love that. I've tried to be a, 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 an aggressive witness for the Lord. In my early days, when I was 19, I wasn't one of my best friend of the Lord. And I tried to witness, and I witnessed a lot. When I came to Bible college, I had to fill out the reports. How many times did you witness this week? Oh, sometimes I think I got to lie. Uh, and of course, it's wrong to lie, but I, I had to keep track of how many. And sometimes I'd really go to work and I'd just really, really witness to these guys. I'm sure they got tired of hearing it. And uh, I, I'm not discouraging witnessing. In fact, I think we use it as an excuse sometimes to say, well, we don't need to pressure people. Let me tell you something. We need to get the word out. Understand that. But I was kind of uh, a little too high pressure, and I, it started to bother me, and I kind of learned to back off. Now, I consistently witnessed throughout the years of ministry, but I'll tell you what's the most amazing thing, is not my smooth presentation of the gospel. 
Sometimes I'd think, boy, I really presented it, and I did my uh, defense of the faith, and I really made that person who says there's no God, and I really won the argument, and I, I would think like that, and I was very unsuccessful. But when God prepared the heart for repentance, I could do the worst job witnessing. I mean, just botch it. Forget what I'm supposed to say and do a lousy job. And I think, boy, I'm really messing up. And someone would say, you know, I've been under conviction. Or I, I felt bad about my sin for a long time and I'd like to be saved. And I'm like, what? I didn't even finish my good story. It's God. It's God. It's God that saves the soul. We just sometimes get to pick fruit that's ready to fall off the tree. God gives us that joy. But God works on that person. And God will guide you if you are listening to the voice of God. He will guide you to uh, cross paths with someone who has a need for that message that you have. That's how God operates. He may not have an angel speak to you. He may not speak to you in an audible voice. In fact, he won't. But he will speak to you. When that coworker says, you know, I'm having a lot of problems. Um, and they cry and they tell you about their marriage or their money. And they come to you and they don't come to someone else at work. They come to you. Why? Because you have the answer. The answer is in here. Faith cometh by and hearing by the word. God's given you this wonderful book. And he's given them a burden. They've acquired excuse me, a burden, an overload of sin. And you can deliver them from that burden by introducing them to the burden bearer, the Lord Jesus. And so here, what a great story. He's, he jumps up there, and of course, he's going to share with him. I love it that he desired, the Bible said he, he desired that he would sit up there and read to him. The Greek said, sir, we would see Jesus. The psalmist said, teach me thy way, O Lord. And we know the way is the Lord Jesus. And so in verse 33, we pick up, it says, in his humiliation, humiliation, this judgment was taken away. Let's back up, I'm sorry. The place of the scripture which you read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shears, so opened he not his mouth. He's reading these two verses right out of the LXS of Septuagint. And, and so he's reading, he wants an explanation. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. What happened here? He humbled himself. I, I love Philippians chapter 2. He emptied himself of all his, uh, you know, he, 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 he chose to die in obedience to the Father. He emptied himself. He could have called 72,000 angels, the scripture says. Love the song, 10,000, but he could have called 72,000 angels. But instead, he was humiliated for us. This great phrase, in his humiliation, the Greek grammar there is, the Greeks translated in regards to Mary, one of low estate. Jesus just was broken for us, and he chose to be. He chose to be. He was willing to be humiliated and spit on and defeated, uh, not defeated, but beaten and, and just humiliated all for you and all for me. He was deprived of justice. He was condemned without a trial because he loved sinners. And, you know, here's Philip. Uh, Philip's going across racial lines by God's direction to reach this man. Paul said we have to be all things to all people. I thought it's interesting. Thomas Aquinas says that we are not to ever call anybody to us from across the room. We're to go to the sinner's side. Chuck Swindoll was telling a funny story about being all things to all people. He said he got on a plane, sat next to a guy, said the guy ordered a Bloody Mary, and when it was brought to him uh, on the way, before, before it got there, the lady went to order it, and she asked Chuck what he did, and he said, well, I'm a pastor. And he said, wait, stewardess, come back. I changed that to a ginger ale. And, and then the stewardess walked off, and Chuck said, you didn't have to do that. I, I, if, it's, if you want to have your, you know, Bloody Mary, go ahead and have it. 
Stewardess, come back. She comes back, said, I'll take two Bloody Marys, one for me and one for him. Uh, but the fact is, if you live in this world and expect the world to accommodate your convictions and standards, you're not what you ought to be in Christ. I had, I, I told you this story years ago, I don't remember when I told the story, but I had a friend of mine, as we, he was kind of zealous, but without knowledge, and we went into a grocery store. He went and complained about the music in the grocery store. It offended him. I said, well, you're not very strong if that music offends you. And I, my comment is, what right do we have as Christians to act, ask the world to accommodate us? We're the pilgrims here. We expect the world to live like that. They're lost. You don't try and disciple people who haven't been saved. Don't put the cart before the horse. We're guests in this world. And just so, you know, we, we realize that sinners live differently than we do. And we don't expect them to change for us. But we find, he says to Philip, and the eunuch answered Philip. And the grammar here means he inquired of Philip. I pray thee of whom speaketh the prophet this of himself or some other man. And then verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him what? Jesus. Isaiah 53 is all about Jesus. He was wounded. That's not Israel. Now the Jew will tell you that's Israel. Uh, even though it's masculine, he and Israel's never masculine. He was wounded. He was bruised. It was for our iniquities. And he preached Jesus because Jesus is clearly seen in Isaiah 53. I tell folks, Isaiah is a great book for witnessing to people who are confused. To the cults who say Jesus began in Bethlehem, go to Isaiah 9, 6. You know, for, for, for the Jew, go to Isaiah 53. I mean, it's just a powerful book. Isaiah is considered the fifth gospel. It's so full of rich material about our Savior. And so he does a, a great job here telling him about Jesus. That's our calling. That's our commission. Go ye into all the world, a direct command, and preach. It's an imperative, Mark 16, 15. And so we are to do that. He was doing that. He evangelized him. I love that. And then we get to verse 36 and 30 through 39. He immerses him. That's what the word baptism means. You say, is it, that's, not, that's not fully translated. Why uh, Bible publishers haven't changed because they sell Bibles to people who sprinkle. But the word baptism means to put under. It's a picture of the death. You don't bury people with three drops of dirt. You don't baptize people with three drops of water. Had a wonderful secretary, worked for me for years, Presbyterian. I would talk about baptism. I was already baptized as a baby. I said, no, you weren't. That's not the word. It's amazing to me. They love their Greek Testament, but they don't find that in there. It's immersion. And so what happens here? Look at verse 38. Uh, verse 36, they went on their way and came to a certain place. Enoch said, uh, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He believed he was a fulfillment of those scriptures. He's the Messiah, the Christ. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water. Philip, both, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, it wasn't a bottle of water. It wasn't a little cup of water. It wasn't a little container of water. They went down into the water. Verse 38 came up out of the water. And then a miracle takes place. Enoch disappears. Enoch. Well, Enoch disappeared too. Uh, Philip just vanishes. And he's found 20 miles away in, in the area of Caesarea, a little town and stayed there 20 years, by the way. Paul would come to visit him years later there, so we know he stayed there probably to help establish a church. We don't know. But 20 years later, he's still there. But he disappears. He ends up 20 miles away. The unit comes out of the water. Look at verse 39. And the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more. But the eunuch, what happened to him? He went on his way rejoicing. He went on his way rejoicing. Remember, Ezekiel was transported and. Ezekiel chapter 3. 
And remember, of course, Enoch, but remember Elijah was you know, translated all the way to heaven in 2 Kings chapter 2. But the word here, uh, in, in uh, the Greek word here, where it says he was caught away is the same exact Greek word and grammar as found in 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. And you know where that is, right? 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. And we'll read that. Uh, it says here, I go so fast that when I stop for these awkward pauses, everybody's saying, is he ever going to start again? Oh, believe me, I am. And then some think he's ever going to quit. And believe me, I'm going to do that too. But 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. We, we know these scriptures, don't we? It says, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. Just like he in an instant disappeared, the eunuch never saw him. That's what's going to happen to the rapture. Sometimes I see a poster and I see people floating up and people watching them float away. It's not how it's going to happen. Sometimes I see dirt coming out of a grave as someone comes out of their casket. That's not how it's going to happen. It's going to be faster than the eye. We're just gone. Just like this. Philip vanished. Appeared 20 miles away. I'm going to vanish and appear, I hope, thousands of miles away. I don't know how far it is. But just like that, he's gone. And look what happens with, with the eunuch. It says here, he went his way rejoicing, rejoicing. What brings you joy? What brings you joy? Why is he rejoicing? Because he's been saved. There's rejoicing in the presence of angels when people come to Christ. It doesn't say angels are rejoicing. It says in the presence of angels. What brings you joy? What, what, is, what does heaven rejoice about? The great commission being fulfilled. And, you know, I'm not a gifted evangelist. I, I, I've preached, I could preach the same message Billy Graham preaches word for word. I've tried it before. And no one comes and gets saved. Uh, God can take an evangelist and preach a message and people just come to the altar. But I'm, my, my calling is pastor, teacher. But I still have to share the gospel because it's part of my calling. That's the good news. That's the start. You know, the seed of the word of God is the start of a new life. And if you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus Christ, uh, I would come to the altar today and say, I've never trusted Jesus Christ. I want to be saved today. And you know what happened? If you're convicted about your sin and you're sincere in your heart, God will save you. Amen. And it's held up for 50 some years for me. I guess I got to say 60 some years now, but whatever, not 60 some. Anyway, forget it. I can't even do the math anymore. But it's been good for me since I was 12. You can do the math. 50 some years. And I could say we could call out here name after name, person after person, seniors that would say, it's been good for me. When God saves you, he saves you eternally and you have eternal life the moment you trust him. But if you don't know him today, you're lost. You're lost. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this wonderful story about Philip who cared enough to obey God and cared enough to jump on the side of a chariot of this eunuch, this Ethiopian man, and tell him about Jesus. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. Help us to be faithful in spreading the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And God, if there's anybody here that needs to come for any other reasons, our altars are welcoming and we just... Help them to sacrifice, give themselves to you in one way or another, whether it's salvation or because they've never yielded to you, to yield. God, and I just pray for any reason, just help us to be accessible and helpful to the folks here. Bless now in Jesus' name.